Hey, I'm James Sykes, CEO, President, Director of Base Lead Energy Corp. It's about time we finally have some assays from Accio from this year's 20,000 meter drill program. And I'm very excited to present some, some of these findings to you and, and just ways to understand what we're actually seeing. So because this is an exploration company, we will be issuing some forward-looking statements here throughout this presentation. So here's our disclaimer. But one of the questions that I had been asked since the discovery last year with the first four drill holes or it's just some of the comments that I heard is that Accio's grades are too low. You know, fair enough. People have their own opinions. But what I want to show you is that these are not low grades. What, we're, what we've just released today are by no means considered low grades. It's just there's a distortion of views and, and how people perceive Athabasca Basin deposits. So let's let's get into this, okay? This is what we're seeing. This was the map from the news release. This is Accio as it stands. You can see where the drill holes that we released came from. These were some of the first 30 odd drill holes. And this is when we were drilling towards the towards the west. So we were coloring to the east and drilling towards the west. The reason why we were doing this is because we were focused on that sandstone unconformity potential. So such as what we were, you know, uh, as the schematic kind of shows with that orange, that orange polygon being the sandstone. So we still think that there's a lot of unconformity potential and just need to find it. So a lot of the drilling that we focused on early on was to, was to look for that type of mineralization as well. So you can see that not every drill hole hit. We originally skimming some of these, some of these ore zones originally. And then as we started dialing in, we would hit with more drill holes as we started coloring more towards the West. So getting to some of the grades that we just released and that's uh, i guess i should have mentioned this we're going to just going to focus on grades you know i'm not going to focus on anything else in this just it's just going to be all about grades for this presentation but looking at some of the results and i've really highlighted the more important ones or the the, the really impactful results where you're getting uh, 20, 0.28% over 10 and a half meters. Uh, you get something in a hole of 11.69 over 3.6 meters. And we'll, we'll talk on that one very shortly here. But even down in a hole of 32, where you're getting uh, basically 0.5.5% over 13.2 meters, that's, that's great. Those are really good numbers to work with. And just to show our discovery hole with the red arrow there, hole one, where we had 0.13% or 15 and a half meters. Now, all of these, all of these drill hole results presented here are better than our discovery hole. So it's nice to see that we are hitting, uh, we're, we're achieving better results as we continue to explore Accio. The other thing I'm going to mention or just point your direction to is on the right hand side of this chart, the GT, the grade thickness calculation, multiplying the percent U through A by the interval thickness, and that gives you the GT. So, for example, that very first interval, 0.28% multiplied by 10 and a half meters gives us a GT of 2.94. So there's a couple holes here, uh, holes 23 and 32 in particular have over a 5 GT. Now, hole 11, though, is just close to 5. But if you look at that interval where the red arrow is now pointing, that was reported as 0.69% over 3.6 meters. However, if you read the notes down below, that 0.36 meters includes 2.1 meters of core loss. That means we had 0.69 meters over 1.5 meters of core. The rest of it was all core loss, but it's just it's over that, that broad interval. So kind of showing what that looks like is the green interval that's, that's not the reported interval. That green interval is where we have the most core loss. You know, we're going from 197 meters at the first green to about 204 meters to the second green. That's seven meters and each row is 1.5 meters. So in that, in that top row, we would have five and a half meters of core loss. That's significant, that's a lot. Uh, we had a little bit of radioactivity from the hand, based on the handheld, handheld scintillometer it just came back at below our cutoff of 0.05%. So a lot of that was around that 0.04%. So still very encouraging, but there, I think there's a heck of a lot more in there. The two red lines is the reported interval. So that's where that 0.69% came over. However, that's from 204 meters down to about 207.8 meters. So you can see that the, that, that 2.1 meters of core loss is very impactful. So we do believe that based on the gamma probe, that there's a lot more. So I, I've kind of had to change the color schemes on this, but the, the gray line on top 
is synonymous with the green lines previously, and then the two black lines are synonymous with the red lines, which is what where we reported our, our results from. That's that 0.69 over 3.6 meters between the two black lines. And even in there, you can see that we didn't capture a second peak of mineralization based on the gamma probe data. Sorry, the red profile or the assay results are the gray profile, and then these handheld scintillometer results are the blue profile. But we didn't capture that big peak. The, the first big peak within the assay is because of the core loss, just not there. But then if you look from the gray line to the first black line, there's a lot of radioactivity down there. It's just, you had about seven meters of, of core loss in there. So we didn't see the, the proper mineralization that was down there. So I humbly believe that we would have had more radioactivity. We, we would have had more uranium from that interval and that GT would have been a lot thicker. So I, I would, Personally, I count hole 11 as being greater than a 5GT combined. So kind of getting back into the whole idea of GT, but also we're going to look at this red box down below. So taking all of those intervals above from holes 9 to holes 32 and just looking at the main ones, not the includes and width, and doing a composite average over all of those, a weighted average over all of those. And it gives us a 0.29% over 12 meters. So let's just say roughly 0.3%. So we're saying that's going to be our average grade just for these holes. That number is going to fluctuate through time as we get more assay results here, there, and everywhere. And even if we start to include the, the lower grade assay results, such as uh, hole one, which still had a nice, beautiful GT of, of two there. But that gives us a GT of about three and a half. So this is still very encouraging. These are these are excellent results, but let's Let's just keep that number 0.3 in the back of our minds as we go through this. Now, just with the GT side of things, I showed this in a previous presentation where with the, with the two GT that we had from hole one, that would fit within these green dots. And we, we're still seeing such things. But now as we see three holes with over a GT of five, we're starting to see results that fit within the yellows. And I just use this as a simplistic way to show that, hey, look, we're hitting, our drill holes are hitting. The, the grades and the thickness combined. So the GT that is required for defining a deposit within the Athabasca. And this is, this is based on a, a chemical slide. So I like to look to chemical as being the guys who know what the heck's going on in the base and how to do things. So if we're seeing resource style of, of intersections already, this is phenomenal. This is exactly what we set out to achieve. And this is why we, we humbly believe that Accio is going to be a phenomenal, uh, a phenomenal discovery once we get all the results back in. The Athabasca Basin. So this is where I want to lead all this because everybody knows it about grade. Everybody thinks high grade uranium, high grade uranium, high grade uranium. And this is Athabasca's where grade is truly king. But does, does grade really matter all that much? MacArthur River, Cigar Lake. Those uranium mines have the world's highest grade for any uranium mine across the globe, over 20% when they started mining. So it's phenomenal. It's absolutely wonderful. They're the most valuable mined commodity in the world. This is why people are looking for these because they're, they're just so enriched. It's crazy. This is extremely valuable ore down there. You get, then you've got recent results such as ISO's hurricane zone over 50% average grade. That's unheard of, truly phenomenal. That is, that's mouthwatering. That is a great, Great discovery there. And then you've got Denison's Phoenix zone at greater than 15%. Absolutely phenomenal as well. Very impressive. A lot of other deposits, McLean Lake, Don Lake, Midwest, Rough Rider, Millennium, Shade Creek, they go back through time. Key Lake, Sioux, Collins Bay. These all go back through basically 50 odd years of exploration and discovery. These have between 1% to 5% average U308. And you've got Triple R, Arrow, Griffin, Fox Lake, just to name a few of the more recent discoveries in the last decade, one to 10% average grades. So this is where everybody thinks Athabasca is always high grade, high grade, high grade, because you've got so many deposits here. I've got a number there and I've got a couple of these deposits underlined. So I say five out of 17, and that's for the, the underlined ones. What that's basically pointing to is that you've got five of those deposits that I've just briefly mentioned there have been mined. The other 12 have not. Some of them are new and they just haven't had a chance to be mined, but which the vast majority just haven't been mined. So that's less than 33% discovery into production rate. That's a very small number. And then the other key point takeaways, the average global uranium grade is 0.1% U308. I'm talking about 0.3 here with, with some of our better results. 
So we're three times higher than the average global grade, but we're not seeing the Athabasca styles. And this is where that, this is where that comment comes in that Accio's grades are too low. Let's continue on with that. Quick map of where we are. There's Accio, Uranium City up to the north. A bunch of mining happened up there in the, the 50s to the 80s. And they built a mill up there, Clough Lake. All the mines, they had 10 mines out there. They built the mill out there. You've got the whole Eagle Point, McLean area, Rabbit Lake. That area is kind of clustered. There's two mills up there. But with all those deposits, they built the mill. Cigar Lake, which took around 40 odd years to get into production, they have, they send all their material to McLean Lake. So the mill's already built there. Same thing, Key Lake built the mill. Then MacArthur River sends all their material down to Key Lake. So all of these major discoveries were basically founded on uh, things that were easy to mine, these open pits and or underground mines, and they built the mills for things to later come on and be mined, such as the monsters, MacArthur River and Cigar Lake. So we're looking at that, MacArthur River, Cigar Lake. These are deep underground. They've got a lot of sandstone cover and there's, there's issues. There, there's a special way you have to mine them. And that's why you can see that only two of these deposits, even though they're the, the highest grades and the largest sizes, compared to all the other gray areas, uh, the gray ones that haven't been mined, there's a special reason they have been because they are the monsters. There's that 100 meter sandstone level that I continuously talk about in other presentations. I keep saying that you need to have less than 100 meter sandstone cover. So these two are well well below that. Now, just a very quick, uh, very quick run through about why it's difficult to mine in the at the basket itself with deeps with a lot of thick sandstone cover and doing conventional underground mining where you need a shaft to go down this is from macarthur river so you can see their ore body there is wedged in the basement rocks but there's a sandstone wedge in there and they've got the upper level at 530 and the lower level at 640 so how they mine that though is they do raise boring so from the, the from the upper level they drill the pilot hole through the ore down to the lower level. And then when they're at the lower level, they put on the, the reaming head and then they just ream it all the way back up to that upper level. And as all the ore comes down, they scoop it up. So that's how they mine MacArthur River. And just to show you how big that, how big that reaming head is on the bottom left there, there's the guy for scale. So it's not a small little bit. They capture quite a lot of ore like that because of the grade there, they get a lot of ore just from, just from reaming, uh, back reaming one of those holes. But these are the challenges. This is what they've had to face. You have to control the groundwater, meaning that, that water coming in from the sandstone because MacArthur River flooded twice. Cigar Lake flooded twice. That's not an easy situation to deal with. You've got weak wall rocks because of the structure that's in the area and because of all the clay alteration. So you need, you need to control all of that. And that's typical for any Athabasca deposit. But there's a lot of weak rocks surrounding your mineralization. And then because of the extreme high grades they have here, you have to minimize the radiation exposure. So if you have lower grades, your radiation exposure is not as significant to deal with. It's still, it's still uranium, you have to treat it as such, but it's not 20% U308, that is just blasting radiation at you. So these are, these are the challenges that anybody who wants to go mining in the Athabasca Basin deep underground, this is what you have to face. This is what the freeze wall program looks like. And this is a 24 seven operation. If these fail, they flood. Simplest, simplistic. When they install these, they, they're freezing the water in the sandstone, freezing all the ground around it to up down to minus 39 degrees Celsius. So it is very cold. The holes are two meters spaced apart and they're about 105 meters long. So that's a big program just to, that's, that's very capital, uh, capital intensive to just to get to before you even start mining. And then to maintain all that, that's an additional operating cost that you have to consider for going underground in the Athabasca. And that's something that baseload, we, we, we wrote off right away. Now, I, I believe that there are more of these deposits out there. Uh, Can Alaska is looking like they've got a nice little discovery on the go and hopefully it really pans out for them. But that's not the way that we wanted to go. We wanted to look for the things that we know have gone into production previously. So when you start getting thinner sandstone cover then these are the these are the mines that have been open pit now these ones here key lake sioux collins bay they've all had over one percent u308 but they've also had significant sandstone cover but they were able to able to do open pit mining with those 
Then if you go further to the, to the left-hand side of this image, you've got a lot of low grade deposits between 0.15 and 0.4%. And These are all amenable to open pit mining. They have been. And you've got no sandstone cover and even, even underground mining. So if you look at Eagle Point, so Eagle Point, the average grades there between 0.75 and 1.75. So even Eagle Point, which went deep, went down to about a kilometer. Uh, but for the underground mining operation, which was added access, they had pretty significant grades there. But when you start looking at more of these, I guess, uh, open pit style of mines. So here at Clough Lake, out of the 10 mines, three of those were open pit mines with grades between 0.35 and 0.4%. That's, a, that's basically 11 million pounds there with, with what would be considered not your typical Athabasca grades. This, is, this Accio has grades that are very close to this. So you can see that even some of the, the underground mines, so they, they would mine the open pits and then do added access into the underground mines this way as well. So it's uh, kind of using the same type of infrastructure. Looking at Uranium City, now you have to remember Uranium City is out in the middle of nowhere. There's no infrastructure. There was no road access. Everything was barged in across the lake. This was done in between the 50s and the 80s. So things were different back then. But still, you had 70 million pounds of uranium, basically with all less than 0.3% mined, mined out of this jurisdiction. So it, it, especially in such a difficult area to work in, they were able to mine a lot of this out as open pits and then through added access. So it's possible, even with Rabbit Lake. I really like Rabbit Lake and I'll do a presentation down the road specifically kind of comparing Accio to Rabbit Lake, but we just need a little bit more information. We need all of our assays to come in before we start really doing that and have some, uh, have the geology really all played out and do a nice comparison. But 0.27% was their average grade that they mined. And that was, that was about 40 million pounds that they mined out of Rabbit Lake. Now, after the Uranium City, Rabbit Lake was the big kicker. Uh, that was the big kicker in the Athabasca Basin area. And that's what really led to the whole, um, I guess, the whole unconformity or just looking at the basin in itself for these deposits. So Rabbit Lake is, is very notable. It's, all, it's a basement hosted deposit, much like Accio. It's open pitable. But that's not, that's not your typical Athabasca grade there. That's 0.27% average grade. I just showed you a number earlier, 0.29%. You know, you start seeing some comparisons here. So this is exactly where I want to go with that. Now let's look down a little bit deeper there in Australia. So the, the two mines that they've had in Australia, Nabarlik and Ranger, look at those grades. Nabarlik is very similar to Athabasca, 1.5%. Wasn't a lot of uranium there, but you look at Ranger. Ranger was a very big mine. Uh, not mistaken, it was over uh, it was over 100 million pounds. I think it was closer to 150 million pounds. It's a great 0.17. Now, Australia, I consider to have a lot of economic similarities to Canada. That's you know, when it comes to cost for, for employment and just for operating and fuels and all that, everything, the, the whole OPEX side of things, I consider Canada and Australia to be very similar. So if, you, if you're able to mine something at 0.17% in Australia, why can't you do that here in Canada? So things to consider. I'm going to have some fun here now with this. These are some, these are some old graphs that I made a few years ago uh, prior to baseload. I'm just fooling around with, with some information on my, my time off when I was trying to, trying to understand the Athabasca in more entirety. You can see that I was doing this back when, the, when I was hopeful that the price of uranium would have gone up to 20 bucks a pound. So everything is, is very old. Um, Obviously, we're, we're over 40 bucks a pound now, so just take, the, take that into consideration. But all things being equal, everything should kind of raise at the same level. Blue are just the number of deposits from the Athabasca, and then the red are the ones that have gone into production. I've got that green line going across, which uh, it's about 450 bucks a ton. That's where that in-situ ton or in-situ in value, and that's equivalent to about 1% U308 at 20 bucks a pound. But you can see where your Cigar Lake and MacArthur River on the far right side, which are both shaft underground operations, their grades are just phenomenal. But what's the theme here? Open pit, open pit, open pit, open pit, decline, open pit, decline, open pit, open pit, and decline. These are what go into production. How many of these other ones with greater than 1% U308 have not gone into production? Why haven't they? Oh, I basically, I, I think I know the answer. I don't know it definitively, but... Sandstone cover. Sandstone, 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 or simply not even large enough. 
again, for other presentations down the road. So I've taken that, that same data and I've just rescaled it here now. I've applied the, the top 10 global uranium producers between 2014 and 2016. They're over there on the right-hand side. I've, I've left that green line there at 1%, but now I've added a, a fainter green line that is equivalent to about 0.25% U308. So that in situ value would be about $100 per ton at 20 bucks a pound. So of the, there are eight deposits there that are all on that right-hand side. And then the two other top 10 producers between that era are Cigar Lake and MacArthur River. So how many of those deposits over on the right-hand side have greater than 0.25% U308? One of them, that's it, just one. And guess what, it's open pitable. All of the others, you've got four ISL or ISR, depending on how you want, how you refer to them. You've got one byproduct, which is Olympic Dam, another open pit at Langer Heinrich, and then you've got an underground shaft work. So in this scenario, you're still seeing more open pits are into production than anything that is operated by a shaft or underground. So it's that repeating theme, no matter where you look. You stay in Canada, it's open pits and declines. You go elsewhere in the world, it's open pits and declines that, that are favored over any underground operation. And just keep playing with the information here. So uh, again, back when I did these, I was looking at a hy hypothetical $80 USD. So now I, I've increased the, the value of uranium for these. And it's just a little bit of fun, $1,800 a pound uh, per ounce. So roughly comparable to what we're seeing today. And I just wanted to see how how these grades would really kind of match up. So again, now that green line there is not 1% youth rate, but it's equivalent to 0.25% youth rate. So we've quadrupled our, quadrupled our price for uranium, which has allowed us to decrease the, the grade by a quarter. So we're still seeing that around that $450 per USD per ton of in situ ore. That's not mined or refined or any other things taken into consideration. That's just an average grade rock and saying this rock has this much value worth it. No applying anything else. MacArthur River, it doesn't look as big as it is because I capped it at 10,000 bucks per ton. Okay, so that's that's up around 35,000, 40,000 bucks a ton. So it's it's way up there. But you can kind of get the idea that you know, these the Sioux deposits that were all open pit mined had a greater value than Red Lakes high grade zone, which has an average grade of two ounces per ton, or even Fire Creek, 44 one grams per ton. So 2% U308 is phenomenal. These are better than your, your highest grade gold deposits. Well, let's, let's consider that number. Let's consider that accurate number that I showed earlier, 0.29%. So roughly around that green line mark. At, at, these, at these valuations, at $80 per pound US, uh, per pound U308 and $1,800 US per ounce of gold, that 0.25% U308 has a higher valuation than 5.1 grams per ton gold. And you can talk to a lot of gold bugs. They'll tell you five grams per ton gold as an open pit mining scenario is high grade gold. That's a, that's a no brainer. Even underground, that's a very valuable mine. So, I guess we kind of have to go back to this. Accio's grades are too low. Well, I don't think they are. You know, I, I think they're the right concentration befitting a mineable Athabasca uranium deposit. We've seen that historically. We've seen that across the globe. We compare it to gold and we see similar things. So this is what we're going to keep trying to prove and just that, that Accio is going to be the next at the basket mine. When we set out for baseload, we didn't want to make a discovery. We wanted to discover a mine. We didn't just want to find a deposit and just let it sit there and dwindle. We wanted to get something going into production and, and bring our shareholders and give wealth to our shareholders for all the belief and trust that you guys have put into us. So we think Accio is, is right. Accio is, is perfect to, to get going. What's coming up next? Well, we're still waiting on more assays and they are coming in. So when can we expect them? I don't know. What can we expect from these assays? Well, I've got a nice little chart there to kind of yeah, give you some, some prelude into what we're gonna look at. The data on the left-hand side are the top 25 individual intercepts that we have released based on the handheld scintillometer results. Now you can see there, you can see the, the front two of the intervals and the CPS. So that's all been released publicly beforehand. The one thing that hasn't been 
is just the synth thickness. So the same way I did a grade thickness calculation, I've done a synth thickness. So taking the interval, multiplying by the average CPS gives us that synth thickness. And I've just arranged all of the data. So these are our top 25 results. On the right-hand side of this image, I've gotten kind of broken out into columns based on when we put that news out. So you can see in 2021, those were the discovery holes and there's hole one. You know, way down there, still makes the top 25. But then in this recent release that we've just done, we've released the orange from March 7th and the light green from May 2nd. Why did we skip April 4th? It's not that we skipped it intentionally. We don't have all the assay results back from that. It's, it's a very bit of a bizarre situation, but I think what's been happening is because we've been bringing, bringing samples in on a weekly basis, is that as the lab's been receiving them, they've just been piling uh, piling the samples on top and top and top. So as they've been taking, they've been taking from the top and working their way back down. So now a lot of our, uh, the ones from this April 4th release are just basically buried. So we're hoping that, well, I'm assuming that they're going to be some of the last results that we put out, unfortunately, but give you a preamble for what to expect. Once you start getting up to these uh, the later releases, you can see that some of these are going to be pretty significant releases. Hole 32, which is right underneath that green line, if you look at that synth thickness there, it's less than 20,000. Uh, the discovery hole for Accu01 is about 10,000. So look above that green line and look how quickly things just jump. You get to 30,000 right away, 45, 55, 70,000, 80,000 for hole 52. So I can expect some really good results, at least fingers are crossed. Fingers are crossed that we're going to see some very exciting results from a lot of these drill holes that were still pending. So are Accio grades too low? Not on your life. This is, this is absolutely perfect. What else are we going to see? Well, in some of these presentations, as more assay results come out, we're going to be talking about cutoffs and why we choose them, how we choose our dilution intersection with the after member. We're only, we're not looking at any economic sort of way of reporting things right now. There is slight economic consideration. But as we're reporting things, it's more of a geological style and, and kind of trying to forecast or preamble into what would be conceived as, as mining. So it's almost arbitrary in the point why, why we're choosing some of these, but we'll, we'll discuss some of that coming up. And then we'll look at some innovative mining ideas. And this is something we we're actually working on already. But so, so when we get start getting the results from, from that back, from those studies, then we'll, we'll share them with you. As we start compiling the, the assay results and all the other chemistry results and just going through uh, refining some of the work that was done this, this, uh, this whole year in 22,000 meters, we'll eventually put out a highly detailed geological interpretation of Accio. And then even before that, though, we'll have all of our sandstone information. We'll do a nice interpretation on that and just show that there's still a lot of unconformity potential. Uh, I, I do humbly believe that there is still unconformity potential on this project, and we will continue to explore it. Even if we're not hitting, even if there isn't any unconformity mineralization out there, it is worth the try, because that would just mean it's shallower and could be potentially higher grade uranium. That's what we're about. We need to find more uranium. We just want to keep finding it with every drill program that we do. Thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it very insightful and educational. And I hope you're along the same lines that we are too, that we believe Accio is by far one of the, the next best Athabasca discoveries with a lot, of, a lot of potential. We've released previously in holes 25 or 52 and 51, we we're seeing mineralization as shallow as 25 meters from the surface. That's open pit style of material right there waiting on the assays. And I think they're just gonna blow everything out of water. So very encouraging stuff. This is, this is definitely very encouraging to watch Accio grow and develop. If you wanna check out more of our educational type of, type of presentations, go to the Oro Group YouTube channel, check us out there, check out some of our other companies. Metal Energies on a tear, American Eagle Gold starting up their drill program. Great looking project out there. QC Copper and Gold is always excellent project out uh, at Odopa Miska. Fantastic, lots of copper out there. So the world needs a lot of copper. The world needs a lot of uranium because we need nuclear energy to fund our energy requirements moving forward. If you want to reach out to me, there I am. You can reach me at infobaselo.com, jsykesorogroup.ca. Follow us on Twitter, follow us on LinkedIn, tell your friends, tell your investor friends. Let's get the word out on Baseload. Thank you very much. Bye.